everybody's doing well. I uh, just wanted to post this lesson, this uh, supplemental lesson online for any, anyone and everyone who is watching at home. Um, you may remember after lesson seven, we had an additional supplemental um, review lesson that covered the first thousand years. Uh, there's an additional one now that covers lessons eight through 14. And that time period is from about 1000 A.D. until 1544 A.D. And so I uh, wanted to post this out in, in case anyone wanted to review what we've been doing, if you haven't been with us the whole time or if you just wanted a review of things. So the time period that we covered, like I said, begins uh, about 1000 A.D. with the Crusaders and, and Scholars section. And that's a navy blue section, which is, of course, the color of France, the land of the Crusades and the Crusaders. So we went through that. We also covered the weak leaders in schism time period, which is a black time period. That was a dark time of, of the church. And that went from the years 1300 to 1499. And then we just recently finished up the protesters and defenders section, which was orange for William of Orange, the Protestant uh, revolution. And that covered the time period of 1500 to 1544. So those are the time periods that we covered. And if you'd like to uh, watch this lesson and review, then you hopefully can, uh, can catch up with where we're at as we move into the next section coming up, which will be the Catholic Reformation. So I will go ahead and begin the recording. Bad bishops, 
exhorting the clergy to live faithfully their promise of celibacy and to teach the faithful the authentic teachings of the church. We see, too, through the example of Gregory VII, Pope St. Gregory VII, who helped to reform the church by ensuring that secular rulers knew that the Pope had supreme authority, supreme spiritual authority in the world, that he was not only a moral teacher, but he was also, even more importantly, a moral judge. And he could judge the actions of secular rulers, and if they were not in, in uh, keeping with, Christian, with the Christian faith or with the teachings of the church, the Pope could then depose that ruler by excommunicating him and, saying, and allowing his subjects then to be free of their oath of loyalty to him. And we see Pope St. Gregory VII have to do that with the Holy Roman Emperor at this time, Henry IV. Henry IV had been involved in himself in this ceremonial practice of what was known as lay investiture, where this is a time of feudalism, where relationships are based between a lord and a vassal over land. And we had many times bishops who were not only bishops in having spiritual and ecclesiastical authority, but they were also vassals of lords, so they had temporal authority as well. And what happened in Germany and elsewhere was this whole concept of lay investiture where there was a ceremony, a feudal ceremony, where the vassal would be given, he would take, would, would give his oath of loyalty to the Lord, and then he would be given the symbols of his temporal office. Now what happened in Germany is that the symbols of the spiritual office, if the man was a bishop, were also given during this lay investiture ceremony. So we have laymen, the secular prince or a secular lord, giving the crozier, the sign of the bishop's office, and his ring to the bishop at the same time as giving him the temporal uh, symbols of his authority as well. So there was this blurring and distinction of who really appoints the bishops. Is it the pope? or is it a secular ruler? And this whole controversy eventually ended through a compromise later after Pope St. Gregory VII died with a compromise where an ecclesiastical official would always present the, the symbols of the bishop's office, his crozier and his ring, to the bishop, and then the secular authority would then give the secular uh, symbols to him. Pope, Pope St. Gregory had to fight this long conflict with Henry IV over it to the point of really ultimately dying as a result of it after he had been rescued from Henry's army that was besieging Rome by the Normans. So then we see after Gregory VII, Blessed Urban II comes to the throne of Peter later, and he begins this whole crusading movement, this, this most interesting time in the history of Western civilization in the church, a time that is so widely misunderstood in our culture today, with images of crusaders, these bloodthirsty, land-hungry, pillaging Europeans going off to the Holy Land to do nothing but to destroy and massacre mus peace-loving Muslims who are minding their own business. This is the kind of modern image that we have of the Crusades, and it's absolutely historically false. As we talked about, there's been a lot of good research recently into the Crusading movement to understand why it came about, why men left and went on the Crusading movement, and the whole importance of the Crusading movement in the history of the Church. And so we had Urban II calling the First Crusade to go to Jerusalem. He calls it as an armed pilgrimage, that war became a penitential act that the nobility and warriors in Rome could, in, in Europe could use their, their, true, their, their tools of trade, to use their vocation in a holy way in order to fight a defensive war, to reclaim land that had been taken by the Muslims, and to liberate the holy city of Jerusalem and to help the Eastern Byzantine Empire from its attack, from, from being attacked against the Muslims. And we, see, we saw too, we discussed how people went on crusade primarily because of their love of Christ. That they, we have research that shows in particular they wrote down their reasons for going, and their reasons for going were that they were concerned for their own souls, and by participating in the crusade you could receive a plenary indulgence, but also they were concerned for the church and for the love of Christ and wanted to return his holy land to the Christian faith. And so the first crusade went and was very successful and was actually able to liberate the holy city of Jerusalem and then established afterwards the four crusader states in Edessa and in Tripoli, in Antioch, in the kingdom of Jerusalem. We saw though how Edessa soon fell after its establishment as the first crusader state and the second crusade was preached by the words of St. Bernard, where St. Bernard motivated and preached to the European knights to have them leave Europe once again and go on this arduous journey to the Holy Land to help reclaim the city of Edessa. And how the Holy Roman Emperor Conrad III and Louis VII of France participated in this crusade. Unfortunately, it wasn't as successful as the first and ultimately failed 
at the gates of Damascus. And then we see how the greatest fear that the Crusaders had would be realized when Saladin comes to power and he unites the two different caliphates that existed in the Muslim world at the time, the Abbasid Caliphate in Baghdad and the, uh, the other, the uh, Fatimid Caliphate in Egypt, and how Saladin brings those caliphates together and then pushes against the Crusader states and engages in a big battle known as the Horns of Hattin in 1187, where he destroys the largest Christian army that ever assembled in the, in the Holy Land. And so then that called, the, and then he goes on to conquer the city of Jerusalem. So the Crusaders only held Jerusalem for less than 100 years, for 88 years. Then we see how Europe responds and calls the, the Pope calls for another crusade, and this is in the third crusade, the Crusade of the Three Kings, where Holy Roman Emperor Frederick II and Richard I of England and then Philip II, Augustus of France, go to the Holy Land and try to reclaim Jerusalem. And they're partially successful. Richard is able to enter into a treaty with Saladin to allow Christians access to the Holy City, which Saladin had forbidden when he conquered it. But that treaty was in existence for only three years. We see then the rise of Pope Innocent III, who brought great innovations to the crusading movement and how he wanted to really centrally manage the crusading movement so that it wouldn't go off track and, and lose steam like many of these other crusades had. And he called the Fourth Crusade, which we saw how unfortunately the Fourth Crusade goes and becomes completely awry and, and just falls apart and goes and conquers first the Christian city of Zara and then goes and sacks the city of Constantinople, which is still a wound felt by the Greek Orthodox Church against the Catholic Church today. And we saw, too, the rise of great saints during this period of time of crusaders and scholars, saints like St. Saint Thomas Becket, who, who maintained and upheld the independency of the church in England against the wiles of his king, King Henry II, the Plantagenet King of England, and how he ultimately was martyred for his faith and for his belief that the church should be independent. We saw, too, during this period of time, the great spiritual renewal ushered in by the mendicant orders of St. Dominic and St. Francis, and how they both came into the picture of the story of the church at the same time in order to help bring about an intense spiritual renewal and activity in order to, to present an imitation of life of Christ and of, an, of a holiness that is attractive to people. We see how the faith then began to grow and to flourish as a result of their new orders that they had created, and how Francis went and begged and, and how he preached to the poor, and St. Dominic established his order really to address heresy that arisen in the south of France, the Albigensian heresy, which the church ultimately had to call a crusade against, but wasn't really that effective. The, the heresy of Albigensianism wasn't really wiped out, wasn't taken care of until the rise of the medieval inquisitors. And we talked about them, why they came into being and what they did and how fair and just their procedures and policies were. And, and their orientation was one towards charity, to bring people back to the faith. We see the other crusades, the fifth crusade that went to Egypt and how that crusade failed, unfortunately, even though St. Francis arrived in the crusader camp and tried to convert the sultan to the faith. We saw the crusade of Frederick II, the crusader without faith, who as an excommunicant went to the Holy Land to try to bring Jerusalem back and entered into a treaty with the Muslim rulers, but was not very welcomed in the Holy Land. And he also fought continuously with the papacy throughout his reign. We had the last two crusades to the Holy Land, the seventh and eighth crusade, or the first and second crusade of King St. Louis IX, the perfect crusader. We also saw, too, the rise of, of great men who provided intellectual growth and innovation during this period of time of crusaders and scholars, the scholastics, men like St. Anselm of Canterbury, St. Thomas Aquinas, St. Bonaventure, who not only influenced theology and philosophy and the study of scripture during their own period, but also during our, even up, up to our modern day where they are still studied. We move into our period of weak leaders in schism, and this time period is really governed by the weakening of the faith because of this, the weak leadership that, that was pres present among the popes of this period of time. This is the period of time of the Renaissance popes, the popes who acted more like secular princes than as the universal shepherds of the church. We see, unfortunately, how the papacy moves from the Pope moves his residence from Avignon to Rome, where he stays for over 70, for almost 70 years, and what an impact that has on the Church and a weakening of respect to the Holy Father. How the Avignon papacy then, or the, how the Church, the Pope leaves Avignon and comes back to Rome as a result of the efforts of Saint Catherine of Siena, but then how we enter into the Church enters into a period called the Great Western Schism, where there were at one point three different men claiming to be Pope 
all of this contributing to a weakness of the church, of her authority, and in particular, the authority of the Holy Father throughout Europe. We see also in a period of time of weak leaders in schism how the, the great Roman Empire fell. And Constantinople finally falls to the Turks in 1453, and so 2,000 years of, Roman, of the Roman Empire are now at a complete end, and how the Turks and the Muslims are now pushing up against Eastern Europe, and will actually in the 16th century and 17th century get as far as the gates of Vienna. So this whole time period of weak leaders and schism leaves us with the church very, very broken, very weakened, in a state that's ripe for a revolution. And we see that happen in our, in our next time period of protesters and defenders, where the, all the ecclesiastical abuses that had grown up in the church over the last several centuries, the abuse of pluralism and absenteeism, simony, nepotism, not obeying the vow or the promise of celibacy, how that all greatly affected the church in the practice of also of, of giving alms as a, receiving an indulgence for the giving of alms and how there was a blurred line of distinction that came into being with that and how that caused problems in the church. And so now the church enters into a period of revolt where people react and revolt against her and fracture her into multiple different parts. We see the rise of Martin Luther that gave voice to the Protestant Revolution. We see John Calvin who organizes and systematizes Protestant theology. We see too how the great island nation of England, which had been missioned to by Pope St. Gregory VII and the sending of St. Augustine of Canterbury in the sixth century, how England moves away from the church because of the whims of one man, a man, Henry VIII, who desired to divorce his wife, Catherine of Aragon, and marry a lady of the court, Anne Boleyn. And we'll see, too, later in our next time period of the Catholic Reformation, how that then leads to England moving from schism into heresy. So it's been an interesting journey so far. We've seen many things happen over these last six sessions. We hope that you continue to remain with us and continue your study, finishing up your 20-part study of church history. All right, so there's the next 500 years of church history, and we've got still more to learn over the next uh, five, six, seven lessons. So uh, thanks again for joining us for Epic, and looking forward to either seeing you in class or uh, you watching the videos, but please continue to ask questions, uh, please continue to participate, and thank you again. All right.